For those that haven't met her yet, tonight's speaker is Mary Priestley. She is a uh, former, she's a past president of TNPS. She's um, a lifetime member of TNPS. She's been nature journaling for 20 years. So she's done it a lot. Um, she has, I have a quote. She says, it's just a small step from listing the plants that you see on an outing to taking a few ecological notes, making a few sketches and keeping a nature journal. So I have actually kept a nature journal sitting on my kitchen table, looking out the window at the birds. <laughs> That's great. And I add my flowers and plants in when they bloom too. And anything major in the, in the weather department. So naturalists and botanical explorers, including John Muir, William Bertram, Andre Michaud, Mark Catesby, and many others keep journal, kept journals. So we're going to be exploring the joy of this practice with Mary and learn how easy it is to incorporate into our lives. And it'll we can use it to enrich our experiences with the with nature. And it's a good habit to teach to the kids. And, but it's not a bad one for us uh, <laughs> mature folks either. <laughs> As our memories start to falter a little bit, it's I find it nice to say, when was when did the first hummingbirds appear? When did my first blossoms? When did the bluebells bloom last year? When did they start? So it's it's nice to be able to, to flip the pages back a year and say, ah, oh, we're early this year. <laughs> oh, we're a little late. <laughs> so it's very handy. Um, without ado, I'm going to say, Mary, welcome. I'm going to turn it over to you. If you want to share your screen at any point, the green button down at the bottom is what you click on. Great. Um, thank you, Karen. And uh, thank you all so much for coming and letting me share this um, joy that I have uh, and that I've been enjoying for the last 20 years, as I said. Um, also, I, I'm just thrilled that, that the society is having this, this series. I think it's just wonderful. I have um, watched a couple of, I watched uh, Dennis not too long ago and enjoyed it thoroughly. Um, so this is my, can you see? Now mine is kind of running off behind people's faces on the right-hand side. I don't know if there's anything I can do about that, but we'll just have to, we'll just have to go with it. I'm um, seeing it fine, Mary. Okay, good, good, good. Okay, Tennessee Native Plant Society, um, nature journaling. I got this uh, first slide of, or these quotations from this first slide um, from Elizabeth Farnsworth, who was co-author of the Peterson Field Guide to the Ferns and senior research ecologist at the New England Wildflower Society. Um, and I thought, and I, I can relate to a, a good bit, bit of this, um, she is suggesting that her nature journal, which she keeps a nature journal, is a repository for data for, and I love this, corner of my eye observations. You know, those little things that you see and that are gone in a flash, notes, sketches, and memories. Um, Karen can relate to this. Incidental notes you take on snowfalls during the winter allow you to track year to year trends. If you've got your put down, you know, when your hummingbirds come through, when your bluebells bloom, I think that's I think um, that's exactly what a nature journaler is up to. And then uh, year round, indoor, outdoor. I've been at this now um, year round for uh, 20 years. Um, as Karen mentioned in the intro, there is a, quite a heritage of um, people who have uh, kept journals, naturalists who have kept journals through the years. Uh, this is a delightful page from John Muir's journal. Um, to, uh, his 2000 mile walk to the sea. We came right straight through the Hiawassee here in Tennessee. Um, and uh, he put little sketches of himself as he, as he went along. Mainly, of course, he, it was text. 
But let's face it, guys, we are not John Muir, nor are we William Bartram or any of those other people. However, and this is this is the really the number one point I would like to make tonight. <laughs> there is no particular uh, way to nature journal or um, reason for nature journaling. Um, I love the fact that Karen keeps her nature journal on her kitchen table. And um, you think about if you if you were to consider nature journaling, um, think about what you like to do already. Is it making, are you a birder? Uh, do you like to let, make lists of plants? I'd like to do that. Do you draw, do you take pictures? I have known two people who did um, study inventories of their piece of property. They wanted, no, actually three now that I think of it. They wanted to know what was growing there, what was living there. And they made these wonderful nature journals that were um, informative to them about their new little uh, special place. Um, we're doing all this for ourselves, obviously, and nobody else. We've got our books and we can keep them shut, our journals. Um, however, we may use our journals as raw material for other things. I sure have. Um, you know, if I have to come up with a, 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 an article or um, something um, about some place where I've been and I can go back and look at my journal and see um, and see what I saw and see what I, I did. Um, we could use it as a, as a springboard for greater insight. And let's face it, it's just a, a beautiful souvenir of our experiences. Now, <laughs> I think everyone should get a field notebook. Just, um, I, you know, I promised I wasn't going to be rigid about this. However, um, honestly, and actually, I think I have the best chance of getting people to do this of anything. Um, there is just so much that goes on on these Native Plant Society field trips or anytime, anytime you get outside. And um, you want to write down where you went, when you went, how you got there, what was there, um, you know, who you were with, where you ate, all that stuff needs to go into your field notebook. And it makes your field notebook a wonderful thing. In addition to that, there are quotable quotes all the time. Bart Jones, May Prairie, <laughs> September that 2010. He comes up with this, this um, acronym, SKG. Well, that means some kind of grass. Here we are, you know, in this little grassland. And then he goes, uh, this was, of course, another moment. He says, well, you know, baby oaks are all weird. <laughs> okay. uh, then come all these other acronyms. I mean, all these people poke their heads up from the grassland, you can imagine. And here's the LBBs and the LBMs and everybody's sharing all their acronyms. And I'm just writing down furiously because I think it's all so funny. <laughs> a few years before that, Todd Crabtree out in Morrison Meadow. Um, somebody asked him why a plant doesn't look like its picture in a book. And Todd, you know how talkative he is. He goes, nature varies, period. I had to put it in. You can't shut that guy up. Um, these, I think, are all from annual meetings. Uh, Foster Falls in two 2004. Bumblebee is squinching down into a, a gentian to pollinate it. And Kay Jones says, what a smart bee, what a smart plant. Um, Dennis is giving instructions for what may be the best wildflower trail in the state. And I'm like, oh my goodness, I got to get this down. Um, up at Panther Branch Trail, blah, blah, blah. Take the right fork. I got that down. Uh, Dr. Chester talking about 25 years of trying to put together um, the floor of Tennessee project. Do not ever start a project with 15 other scientists. And Fall Creek Falls, that was where um, Alice took that picture of me. We were out in the woods with Tom Kimmerer, who said, a forest is sort of a random walk through time. I mean, you can start a book with a sentence like that. Forest is sort of random walk through time. I just thought that was beautiful. At the Yatemans, 2001, Al Good, looking at a grove of chestnut trees, says that's as lovely a grove of chestnut tree, chestnut oaks as I've seen. You sit here and get a little lift 
feel like the whole world is a better place. I mean, that somebody's got to write that down. Big South Fork, Ed Kletch. Oak and deciduous azaleas have clustered buds at the tip of the branch, and that's it. Well, if that's it, that must be written down. When trout lily's good, it's great. Uh, everybody knows that. And then at a, the what's called the turnpike above Cowan, um, and actually I can't even see what I'm written here, but um, she talks about all the interesting things up there and that you have to go back maybe once a month. And then she talks about coming upon a game warden um, on another one of her outings who said, didn't you see the signs? And she says, no, we didn't see any signs. We came on through. <laughs> That's Margaret Reinhardt for you. Okay, last page. This is the last page of this silliness. Um, Shake Rag Hollow, 2019. And Dennis Horn, I have documented it right here and now for the Tennessee Native Plant Society. As far as I'm concerned, it's the best wildflower display in Tennessee. We'll see what he says about that. Um, and then someone else said, and I don't didn't write down who it was, that this wildflower display in Shake Rag Hollow is like the mountain is singing. Susan Sweetser. And this speaks to what I'm really talking about tonight. When you get older, you narrow your focus, but you also broaden it too, because you have time to sit and pay attention. And I think that says a lot about what I'm trying to be up to with my nature journal. Okay, this is a model, this is fake pictures, but um, I just wanted to show you that um, it is possible to carry your, your field notebook and a walking stick at the same time and um, do very, very well, you know, if, especially if you're out in the middle of a parking lot, but you can also make it down the trail with a notebook in one hand and a walking stick in the other, if that's what you need to do. This though <laughs> is um, on the left is a uh, page out of one of my field notebooks and then an extravagant over the top journal entry about the same event. Um, and you can, I've never, I mean, I don't know why I did, went so crazy, but I did. Um, I think though it does point out the contrast between what I consider a field notebook and a nature journal. If you look up here in the field notebook, um, Cucumber Gap, Elkmont, Great Smoky Mountains National Park, April 25th, 2019, Alan Sweetser is leading the hike. Uh, it gives us a little history. Here are some people who went on the hike. Um, start hiking up the old railroad bed, up Jake's Creek. And then as always, I start listing the plants that we see. Um, someone mentions that yellow trillium, strong scented, smells like lemon pledge. Um, well, I mean, that's a great, that's a great diagnostic character. Um, and I, I put it down. Uh, creeping flocks, which we don't have here. And I have wondered what, um, you know, how you can tell it. And um, they're talking about the large opening. You can't really read that very well. I think the stamens stick out the large opening. And um, I was glad to have that, that information. Back over here, this is a previous walk, the walk that I did before that one, not sure, but here's some more um, plants listed. Interesting thing about Lewis and Clark, the flowers of Solomon seal taste like peanuts. Hello, did you know that? Well, I documented it. Then we, then uh, here's my, what I did. Um, and I think I must've been doing this for somebody else's benefit. But anyway, this, these are some drawings that I did in the nature journal I had at the time um, of Elkmont. And I included way down at the bottom, a little bit of a poem by Emily Dickinson. Um, for me, for me, and, I, and I'm really and truly, um, I hope that when we have the, the uh, discussion at the end or Q and A or whatever, if other people keep nature journals, I hope that you'll talk about what you do. But for me, a typical journal entry, one entry, is an up-close look at one organism, usually a plant. I include what I want to remember. Page looks nice enough to come back and enjoy. Um, I feel, 
And I know that, that it, well, I could get some argument from this group because we've got some wonderful photographers, but I honestly feel like drawing really, really helps you look more closely and see things more clearly. Um, if you're working at getting, you know, the curve of that stem or the, um, well, like for instance, on this Halberd Lee Violet, I worked hard on that. Um, and, but see, my product is not all that great. I mean, it looks bumpy. Um, what I wanted to do was to show that it was variegated. Um, so I, you know, scratched in all those little light patches, um, missed the mark though on the product, but my, um, but the process was, was well worth it. Um, Gerda said, you really don't see a plant until you draw it. And now, um, I think there are three components of a nature journal, text, images, and numbers. Um, and depending upon your, your ilk, your bent, um, you might lean more towards text or more towards um, images. And that would be maybe photographs or drawings or anything, but, uh, clippings out of the newspaper. But um, uh, numbers are actually a part of things too. This entry right here was about a day I spent with two women um, showing them around the domain and taking um, a couple of little, one big hike and one little sort of outing. Um, so it's mainly text. Um, however, there, there are some numbers in there. Um, uh, I've got the page number, for instance, and there are two women and so forth. Um, so there are some numbers that support it and the sketches support it. But basically, I wanted to get down the information that I had about these two women. Um, the, the entry actually goes on to the next page. So um, it doesn't really end there, but this is one that it's really mainly text. And I just wanted to remember that day. Um, besides the three components, there are three prompts. I, I guess prompt would be the right word to use. To, to help you sort of deepen your uh, experience with nature journaling. Um, the, the first one is really um, uh, just observation, just documentation, what we've been talking about already, writing down um, or, or sketching uh, what you see or hear, um, so forth. That is, I noticed that would be the first prompt, which is the most obvious one, which is where we all start. But then after that, um, what questions come up? What questions come to you about what it is that you are observing? Um, they say that good questions are better than um, answers. Um, I myself, though, will probably go straight to some uh, reference or Wikipedia or something like that to try to come up with the answers. But um, there are all kinds of things that you, that you wonder about um, these things that we see and then um, and take note of. And then the third thing, uh, this reminds me, oh, and by the way, all three of these came from John Muir Laws, um, is a really, really powerful um, prompt. And I did another page on this. Um, the idea is that you're in a place or, or you're drawing a plant and you're trying to think about connections that this place or this plant or this experience has with you, with your, with your past or things that you remember from um, poetry or, or uh, something you read. Um, it also um, builds connections um, with, between you and whatever. Now, I'm gonna um, grab my notes um, because I have, um, oh, all these great quotes. <laughs> um, okay, because y'all's pictures, which I love to see, are covering up the text on this thing that I wanted to read out loud. So um, this quote from, from John Muir Laws, for any place you know intimately, there is a relationship with the land strengthened by your observations, number one, but also your deliberate recollection of relationships. 
The act of deliberate attention is the best way to build relationships, both with people and with the natural world. And um, this uh, building of relationships starts with connections that you can make between the place or the, or the organism or whatever and other experiences or other places where you've been. Okay, here's an example uh, where I'm trying to put the three uh, components and the three prompts together. Um, I don't know if any of you all have ever been to Bell's Cove when the jonquils are blooming. This is down at the foot of um, our mountain in the Pelham Valley. And um, there are about three acres of these little tiny old fashioned jonquils um, that bloom for you know, several weeks. Uh, and I start down there in February or maybe January if I can't stand to wait and then make several trips down there every, every spring. So uh, on Mardi Gras, which was March the 1st, I visited and um, picked 40 blossoms for $2. It's a nickel a blossom and it is just a wonderful experience. So I get home and I've made a, a journal entry and um, Jonquil Fields, Mardi Gras visit to Bell's Cove in Pelham, met Mr. Gillum and his sweet doggy. Well, Mr. Gillum actually is the owner of these fields. He said his grandfather had planted jonquils in rows 90 years ago. When they got too thick to bloom, they slowed, they plowed the field and the blooms increased. I picked 40 at five cents each, planning to go back for some bulbs. Good times, lovely place, 3122. Now, the thing about this visit, though, was that when I, as I was walking out into the fields, I felt something on the back of my leg and I, and I look around and it is the cutest, fluffiest, big black dog I have ever seen. And he just sat down, just sat down right there when I turned around. Um, and um, it was just, it was just great. And I, it just really made, and I've been, as I say, gosh, I've been there 20 times over my life and uh this visit that little dog came up to me and i um it was just special a week later i drew a couple of the jonquils and you can see they're looking a little worse for wear and then i might have to have you read this to yourselves because again you guys are in front of my text um, i had a dog who loved flowers and how easily she loved them and not in the careful way that we choose to love this blossom or that blossom, or we love or we don't love, but the way we long to be that happy in the something of earth, that wild, that loving. And I thought, yeah, yeah, that's perfect. And that enhances my experience and I will never forget it. Mary, in order yeah. to change your view, top right, it says view. That's what you think. I don't see. And you can do side by side speaker. Well, I'm I'm just I don't see. Or side by side gallery. I don't seem to have any. Um, you are screen sharing. Stop share seem to be my only choices here. Hmm. But that's okay. okay. You all can read. <laughs> okay. I'll just have to leave it up to you to read. Is that <laughs> all right? I'm sorry. I guess I could get rid of all these people, but I don't want to do that. Okay, um, this though is a more typical um, page. Um, every, I draw pokeweed absolutely every year. And um, I love this rank weed, I just love it. And um, so I drew it again this year in uh, October, pretty late actually, um, and um, wrote down a few things about it um, and, um, you know, called it a beautiful plant, which is sure true as far as I'm concerned. And um, again, I'm repeating this sentence that I had in a previous slide. For me, a typical journal entry is an up close look at one organism, usually a plant. I include what I want to remember and the page looks nice enough to come back to and enjoy. Here's another page. Um, this one's my color. Uh, I almost always start every drawing with pencil and then I go over with, with pen and then either add color or don't. Um, in this case, what I did was to 
probably use a watercolor colored pencil and um, just to try to give it a little bit of uh, three dimensionality. Um, I like to draw all the way across the page of the, the spread, the two um, facing pages. Um, and then sometimes it's fun to put in just a little landscape. Uh, I think it's a hoot that the area behind this subway has got all these, it's, they're weedy, but they're just beautiful, all these flowers behind the subway um, that now you all know about as well as I do. Um, if you start drawing and um, want to start drawing, want to start sketching, it uh, sometimes when people that start, or certainly when I started, all my drawings were very small. And I found that if I put a little frame around them, it gave them enough sort of a oomph to, um, to sit there on the page and, and, um, and, and take and have their place. Um, cartoons are funny and I like to do those. Um, anytime you have two animals interacting, you have a story. And this is one that occurred a year ago on this rock out in front of our house, there were these two black vultures standing there and all of a sudden they made it. And I was like, I cannot believe I am here for this moment. It was so wonderful. Then these two turkey vultures arrive and then this third turkey vulture arrives and one of the initial turkey vultures goes over and kicks the third one off the rock, just kicks him off the rock. And you know how they, they don't walk very gracefully anyway. And so go whomp, off goes that one. And then it came back over to stand beside its mate. Uh, meanwhile, on the, to the left of me, there were these three turkey vultures in this tree having these fits. And I'm like, this is just amazing right here in front of me. Then I tried to draw, do, write a haiku, which is when that little yellow bubble thing, which is really wasn't very good, but... Um, it was uh, just sort of a, a, my response to um, what was going on. Uh, here's another one. I love to do maps, love to do maps. And uh, this is a, a walk that I take with a couple of friends almost every Sunday morning. It occurred to me that um, it would be interesting to, to do this as a work in progress so that from time to time, um, based on what's blooming or what I see, I document that on this, um, on this map. Um, there is, uh, see down here by, right down here, a great big tree fell down and it was so rotten in the middle, it split. This other tree was standing here and it, it, it split right down the middle. I'd never seen anything like that before. Um, Unfortunately, this other one here has since died because it, it lost so much of its bark and everything. But um, there are all kinds of things happening, you know, different, different plants um, up and blooming. The mountain laurel is particularly uh, beautiful to walk through. And then I've got another patch of mountain laurel over here. Um, these wonderful Christmas ferns. Anyway, it's a really neat path. And I guess I've walked it many, many times. And I am now slowly adding more and more observations. Oh, so then um, this spring, based on the fact that I love to do these maps and have been doing these little maps in my nature journal, this is an example of something that has grown out of an interest that I have, um, have nurtured through my nature journals. And this is a map of the waters of um, Swanee. All the named creeks, uh, where they start, where they join up and everything. Um, it's interesting to note that if you're familiar with the campus, there's an area called Louisiana Circle, which is where the original um, cornerstone for the university was laid before the Civil War. Um, it's the highest point on the central campus. And so then if you know that, and then you say, oh, well, it makes all the sense in the world that that little creek runs that way and that little creek runs that way and that little creek runs down here to Lost Cove and this little creek runs down here to Hawkins Cove and this is Shake Rag where all that's running. And um, it uh, has pulled a lot, um, has pulled a lot together for me. I, I really enjoyed doing that. And again, that was an outgrowth of an interest that I really got going um, with the nature journaling. 
don't forget you can glue stuff in, all kinds of things. One of our um, people in our nature journaling group, I, we have a nature journaling group, uh, did some, dye, helped mm -hmm. us dye papers with um, uh, alum and, and leaves. And so these two pieces of paper are, have been dyed with um, these leaves. Um, and this was right after Christmas. Uh, so I drew this amaryllis blossom on one of the papers, plopped it into some water, and it was just as fresh the second week, a week later, and I drew it again. So these are just two attempts at drawing the same amaryllis flower um, one week apart. They do a lot better than the jonquils a week later. <laughs> this is something I'm just starting to get interested in doing, which is uh, called a phenology wheel. Uh, phenology is the responses of the natural world to the change of seasons. The first phenology wheel I did was, um, I did it for the month of May. And basically every day in May, I made one observation and I drew this big pie and all these slices of pie. And um, every slice has a different picture in it. Um, for the month of May. And it's really fun because the seasons, you know, progress and, and uh, May 1st and May 31st look a whole lot different from each other. Then I decided to try doing it right around the equinoxes and the solstices. And so this is the one that I did right around the autumnal equinox. Um, and we had a, 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 a mink that these mink, these mink over at Fiery Gizzard were tumbling down the uh, I guess they were playing and just screaming um, in Fiery Gizzard when I was down there on the 20th, um, full moon the next day, autumnal equinox the next day. This is obviously late September. And then on, on, on um, into October. Here's October 3rd and a little, I guess that's a black gum leaf um, uh, turning red and falling down. Uh, I'm going to um, do this sort of thing, I think, with the uh, um, nature journaling class in, um, in the Smokies mm -hmm. next week. Instead of doing a phenology wheel, though, uh, I'm just going to ask everybody to do a circle, break it into the number of wedges, pie wedges, um, of activities that they plan to have over the course of the um, pilgrimage, and then put an observation in there for each one of their, their experiences so that they'll have in a very uh, compact and I think attractive way, um, a picture of, of all of the things that they did at the pilgrimage uh, that week. Okay, getting started. Um, I suggest if you wanna try to do this and haven't already started, or if you wanna start up again, I suggest buying a bound unlined journal um, rather than spiral just because I really like to draw all the way across the page and um, and that ditch in the middle um, doesn't help it. Um, I, I'm a coward and so I start my drawings with pencil and then go to pen. Um, my two favorite ones are Univall which is a pretty thick uh, actually ink and then Micron which is a, an artist type pen that comes in a lot of different um, widths. Um, I buy either just black or sepia. They have a lot of colors of the micron. I haven't, um, haven't gotten into the colors yet. And then, so then you've got your blank journal and um, I leave a few blank pages for the title page and the table of contents. Then later, later I did this uh, um, title page here got this great poem of Mary Oliver's, cut up this um, painting I was tired of looking at. And so this is my title page. This is my current journal and it's not quite finished. So when it is finished right down here, I'll put the dates, the beginning and ending dates. Then you leave the next couple of pages blank as well for a table of contents. Um, and Here's the beginning of my table of contents um, for this current journal. Turns out that I ran out of room and I, I've had to continue this on the last page of the book, but that's okay. And then if your journal does not already have a little envelope in the back, and a lot of them do have a little envelope as part of it, 
stick an envelope in there for stuff that you will just pick up that you may want to incorporate in your entries or may not want to incorporate. Um, but this on the left is a clear plastic um, envelope that's in the back of another one of my journals. And that kind of thing you start picking up and um, may or may not incorporate. Then the terror, the fear of actually starting to draw in this beautiful new pristine book that you have purchased. And what I do, and this is what I've done about my next one, because I'm just about to go into my next journal, is I just take some watercolor and just splatter it all over a whole spread. And that is where I will start my first entry. So I'll just draw right over that and, um, and incorporate all those little blobs in uh, in the drawing, and uh, and I've see I've already broken it in, so I'm I'm ready to go, uh, and I'm not afraid of it anymore. I wanted to show you one really quick and easy technique. If you, uh, of course, they're all kind. Of, you know, once you start journaling, then you get all this um, equipment and all these materials and everything, and it's really fun. But this is a a, a quick and easy thing to do. Is to find a pen that is not waterproof. Pilot pens are not waterproof. So um, you can draw with a pilot pen and then go over it with water, just a little water and the lines will bleed and it really comes out into a very nice pen and ink with wash, I think. Um, the Jack in the Pulpit I did as a demo in the middle of a, a nature journaling group last week and uh, just drew it you know, really quickly and put the water on it. And then this um, trout lily, I took a little bit more time with on my own. Um, I'm not really all that good at it, but honestly, I don't think you have to be all that good at it. I think they're, they're perfectly fine little drawings and they would go great in your field, in your, not in your field notebook. Do not use pilot ink on your field notebook because it will run as soon as you get your notebook in the rain. Pilot is for your nature journal, which stays inside. This though is the key right here. This is how you keep nature journaling for 20 years. You get yourself a group of people who also want to do it with you. Um, this was the, what we, we called ourselves the Dead Plant Society. Uh, Jill Carpenter on the far left um, got us all together. She was our organizer. Um, we had more people than this from time to time. You may recognize the two in the middle, Mary Davis and Yolan Gottfried, who are both members of the Native Plant Society. Jean Yateman is on the other side of Yolan. Um, but we gathered every week, uh, once a week, every week. Uh, and then Jill just, um, I think, just couldn't host it anymore. And she was so apologetic. Um, I just thanked her for the time that she had spent in um, <clears throat> promised her that I would always nature journal, which I, you know, I'm doing it right on into my golden years. Here I am doing it still. And the, um, talked to the uh, director of the Swanee Herbarium into uh, sponsoring a nature journaling group. And so we now meet on Thursday mornings. There are 15 or 16 people on my email list. Um, it's, it's, uh, I think it's growing and it's um, a whole lot of fun. And I, I would love for any of you to join or just drop in. Don't drop in unannounced because no telling where we'll be. This is a picture of us out at uh, one of the members' houses. Well, we've come just about to the end. Uh, Karen and I discussed earlier in the day this uh, four-page handout that um, I've prepared and sent to her by email. And I think she's going to post it on the, on the web page of the uh, TMPS web page. Yes, I'll post it next to the video. Great. On the great. seminars page of the website. Great. Thank you so much. So if there's anybody interested in, in this um, sort of detail, um, that's where it'll be. There are, of course, heaps and heaps of resources out there. Um, these are three that I selected just to, because, I, uh, well, John Muir Laws on the far left is a, really a, has come to be quite a guru of nature journaling. He's got a lot of stuff on the web, a lot of free stuff on the web. Um, um, 
lessons and things and um, and in his written books like this one right here. On the far right, uh, Kathy Johnson is just a, a wonderful artist and um, person. And I really enjoy watching her on the web as well. Um, this artist journal workshop has got a chapter in it about nature journaling. And Susan Lee Tomlinson, who wrote the book in the middle, uh, enjoys uh, nature journaling with groups of people, which is what, uh, which is what I do. And so um, uh, I, I can relate um, a lot to what, to what she does. This ends my presentation. Um, I hope that, that um, I know, let's see, if Latham is, is up here, he does, um, let me stop sharing. Oh, that there was are. wonderful. Oh. Thank you, Mary. Oh, you're welcome. Um, let's open the floor to questions then. Or comments or statements, comments. Anybody with something they want to say or a question that they have? Or a story to tell about. Uh, yeah. <laughs> a yeah. few comments. I've got a question. So Mary, do you, do you work in uh, pencils? I mean, what would you recommend? You know, do you do you like pencils or the watercolor pencils? Um, yeah, I use really watercolor pencils more than anything. You do okay. Um, they're uh, handy. Starting with pen, I think I think um, they're handy, easy. Yeah, yeah. Um, we have some people in our nature journaling group who are really quite good with watercolors, and it's just marvelous. I think the reason I do, I go, I start with pencil go to pen and then go to colored whatever, if I go that far. Um, because I can't really see my pencil lines all that well and I can see my pen, pen lines. So it's really sort of, okay, now I can see what I'm doing. <laughs> now I can go into the color, whereas I think I would be afraid to do color and then ink, although a lot of people do it in that order. So, you know, it's up to you. What do you, what, um, Kim, what do you, use i uh i'm i'm just a loser at this really i i'm so anal it's got to all be perfect or you know and and as a biologist i'm you know i'm doing sketches all the time for classes but then when it comes to something i'm doing you know it's just loosey-goosey if i have to just make it perfect then i just shut down emotionally oh so i'm really excited well we could start a support group <laughs> I may just come up to Swanee on one of those Thursday mornings and hang out with you guys. So boy, would that be fun. We would feel, love that. I feel inspired. <laughs> I, I had a question. Um, do you use your field journal as a reference point for your nature journal? Um, I have, I have, although rarely I find, I find that those are really two very separate mm -hmm. things. I think. Um, the nature journal is, um, uh, just the way, the way we've got set up our little group. We uh, bring something to nature journaling group every, every week. And, um, and let, well, and, and occasionally I do entries on my own separate from that. Um, the little, the one with the jonquil fields was done separately from that, but I think those are two different things. I really do. And I think they are fodder. Uh, both serve as fodder for other um, other projects and things um, separately. So the field the field notebook is just notes that you not just but it's notes you take when you're on walk to right. about right. phenomenon you see and and exactly. the journal is more in depth on one thing and somewhat more poetic. Yes, gosh, that's well well put. Yeah, and I mean the you know the field notebooks, a lot of times I'm walking and writing at the same time, trying to make it at least legible, you know, but um, the other, I try to have, I really neaten up my handwriting and things, to make okay. it nicer. Thank you. There's one question in the chat that I think is, probably covers a lot of us. Uh, it says, I, I can barely draw stick people. Any suggestions on how to get started for someone who has no drawing ability 
Thanks. Oh, wow. Well, you just simply have to start drawing. I mean, that's all there is to it, really. Um, it, it has been so interesting. And um, some, some people here who are in, my, are in our group can jump in and, and, uh, and share that we have um, in our group, um, people range from having been in the group for one session to having been in the group for like six months and never drew before they came in. So they're sitting there. And I mean, I think that would be really pretty um, tough to come in and you're sitting around the table with these people who have been drawing for 20 years, some of them, or 15 years, some of them. And, um, and they've been having, you know, they thought they might like to start drawing. And so um, here they are. And they just simply start. And it's, it's, it's just phenomenal. I, I guess it's just like anything else. It's a skill like anything else. Um, you know, this business would be, I'm sure that, I'm sure that there are talented, very talented artists that as far as drawing is concerned and trying to uh, make a drawing that, that is of representational of something, that's a skill and you just have to keep doing it. So. Oh, 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 you know, what would be really cool, Karen, is if somebody would, would um, from, from one of your um, uh, field trips that the, that the society takes, if someone did a sketch or two as part of their report um, on, the, on the trip, that would be really, really extra cool. Um, that would be inspiring. It would. <laughs> it would. <laughs> Well, on, in regard to making notes, uh, it is hard to make notes while you're walking, but uh, then you try to, uh, try to identify that later. And on, <laughs> on, uh, on uh, drawing, drawing things, it is very uh, important or has always been for the artists uh, very important to make like you have on sometimes draw half a flower what what was important on that flower or this if the stem had hairs or so so uh, so that is and if you look at the artists from from ancient times that's what they did and they also uh, naturally used to incorporate the bugs what you might say bugs insects right. and butterflies and so but uh, uh, in, in a, it, I got my father's books and they are done from, uh, from paintings. And you can see more things in that than you can, uh, can in, a, in a photograph at times. Yeah, but I think that's true. I but think, on, I your think... Notes, on your notes, write that, Right, that uh, uh, make a drawing of that crooked seed part or so, so that way you uh, uh, you uh, uh, remember and uh, continue studying those plants wherever that uh, the the dandelion is one of those things I love to study in all books that I can find, no matter from which century they are. Yeah, there's some beautiful, beautiful scientific illustration. Um, in in those books and and you're right i mean you know these field guides where you they're like peterson's that has these drawings drawings and little arrows to the diagnostic features um and that's very very hard to duplicate that in a in a photograph i think um i have a comment can you hear me yes <laughs> you can hear me <laughs> yes Okay, I have a comment on the, on Ke on Karen's earlier question about style, and um, it's easy to be intimidated by uh, by some of the major journalers, including Mary, <laughs> including Mary Priestley. Mm -hmm. um, my suggestion is, uh, or my thought is, that uh, everybody has a style, uh, and it may not be a perfect style. But um, everybody, uh, everybody can have a style, and it's just important to find out what that is, 
And it's helpful to have um, a sense of humor about it. Uh, so that sometimes your drawings might look funny, but uh, just laugh about it because <laughs> that's your style. And it can be lots of fun. Anyway, that's my, that's my that's comment. Great. That's great. Thank you. <laughs> I can give one example of something that happened when my son was young. He wanted to draw a picture of his dog, but at seven years old, he, was, he told me he couldn't draw. He couldn't draw yet. I said, of course you can draw. You can draw your dog. She's such a sweetheart. Can you draw a heart? He said, yes. I said, draw a heart. So he drew a heart. I said, okay, give it a head and some ears, and a tongue, and give it four legs, and a tail that's a wagon. <laughs> that's your puppy dog. Uh, <laughs> you just have to simplify, even if it's down to a stick figure to start with, like Mary suggested. Stick figures can still communicate. Oh, and yeah. Gradually, that stick figure is going to get more and more shape to it. You know, Rabbits are easy. You, you could draw a circle for a rabbit, a circle for its tail, and a circle for its head. You know, and then you stick a couple ears on it. You got a rabbit. <laughs> How many of those rabbits have we seen in the last week? <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's so true. You, know, so true. you just have to simplify it down to what you can manage and start there. Right. I think if you think it would be a way to <laughs> increase your enjoyment of nature, then go for it. And, um, mm -hmm. and, uh, and also, I honestly don't think I have ever seen a bad pen and ink drawing, if you want to know the truth. Um, there's something about that medium that uh, I don't care how bad you think you are, pen and ink is, the, is a beautiful medium and the most forgiving medium I think there is. Okay. When I showed my grand uh, my granddaughter the names, she has a journal and she is doing it, and uh, uh, and uh, she is quite talented. Wow, that's wonderful! And, uh, don't know where she know, got it from, <laughs> but uh, you see, this is one of the one of the paintings on a Hieracium in uh, in the books that that I learned where these were my father's books. It's extraordinary. You can see slightly, slightly worn. Wow. That's beautiful. Just beautiful. Well, this has been absolutely delightful, Mary. Well, thank you all so much. I sure enjoyed doing it. Thank you. We have enjoyed it also. And uh, for those that, that uh, you know of that maybe missed and had hoped that they would make it to the seminar, just tell them it'll be on the website by the end of the week. Okay. Thank you, Karen. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Mary. <laughs> <laughs> and for those of you that are TNPS members, don't forget we're uh, closing in on our conference. We need to do registrations. Um, you need to send in $25 per person for registration. And then we also have to book our room. Um, the best way to book the room at the hotel is to call that hotel directly, not go through hotels.com or something else. Call the hotel directly. The number is posted on the website and ask for the front desk. If you tell them at the front desk, that you're with the Tennessee Native Plant Society, you will get the good price, which $69 a night is really a bargain compared to 129. Mm. So if you don't tell them you're from TNPS, they won't know it and you pay the full price. So. And I think, is it breakfast included or no? Do I have yes, that? Yes, it problem? is. Yeah, so it's a good deal. It's probably the continental breakfast, you know, the, the typical. <laughs> And then, um, but it's a start. <laughs> pay up, you know, if you sending checks again, Karen and I pass money back and forth through the mail. Sometimes we rendezvous halfway, but PayPal is just so easy. And I've been getting a few registrations through PayPal, but, uh, you know, and then that way you can go all the way up to the last minute 
Whereas if you wait and mail your check on the 28th, you know, there's that lag of, you know, the communication between Karen and myself. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you everyone for visiting tonight. Uh, thank you, Mary, for a very interesting presentation that's got me thinking about how I'm going to make some changes and put some different implements with my on my kitchen table. So <laughs> along with my journal. <laughs> we'll see what I can do. <laughs> All right. Good night, everyone.